do it. Let's jump into this and first talk about self-custody. Mike, what's the difference, you know, when you think about it, what's the difference between custodial and non-custodial? And when we say non-custodial, you're gonna hear us use a lot of jargon, a lot of terms, we're gonna try to limit that, but non-custodial, self-custody, same thing. Custodial wallet is a little bit different. What's the key differences there? What do people need to know about? Well, in blockchain technology, crypto is a, a byproduct of blockchain. Um, everything comes down to something called a private key, which is a very long alphanumeric um, string of digits and numbers that represents your crypto on a blockchain. It's kind of like a, like a bank password. You can think of it like that. Um, now, this is a very long figure, and it's very hard to write down, um, and it's very easy to misplace. And as a matter of fact, 20% of all crypto is lost, not through hacks, but through people just simply losing their seed phrase or their private key. So in a custodial account, kind of like uh, Coinbase, you don't have direct access to your private key. So they're safeguarding that for you. And because you don't have access to it, you can't trace your digital assets on a blockchain one to one. So you can't be sure that they actually have your crypto. Um, you just have to trust that they have them. But the problem with trust is blockchain was designed as a trustless system. It wasn't designed um, for these centralized exchanges. It was designed for self-custody. And, well, and I think it, that that's a good point right there. What you kind of key in on is centralized exchanges. When I think about custodial, um, you know, the opposite of self-custody here, it's that somebody else is a custodian, right? Um, it's not that it's it's not bad or anything like mm -hmm. that. It's just there's two different ways to approach this space. On one hand, you have your account with Tasty Trade. You have your account with Coinbase or others. Everybody knows who the crypto players are. You're trusting them to protect that crypto, to hold on to it for nothing bad to happen, right? Um, and I think, you know, for the most part, um, it makes sense to trust those. Sometimes it's easier to trust those yeah. entities, right? It's not like better or worse necessarily. I mean, I think some people would argue for the self custody side of it, but that's the big difference. It's yeah. who holds the key, who holds the keys, right? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. And uh, my first interaction with crypto was in 2016 or 2017, and I used probably like you, Ryan, Coinbase, because I didn't know what a self-custody wallet was. Um, but when you have a self-custody wallet, you are the only party privy to that private key. So you, you're going to have ownership of your assets, and you can look it up anytime you want. If you have uh, Bitcoin, you can look up on the, the Bitcoin blockchain, or ETH, you can look up on the Ethereum blockchain. You don't you know it's always going to be there um, as long as you're safeguarding that private key, which we interpret as a seed phrase because a seed phrase is a little bit easier to remember and write down. Um, and that is the primary difference between a, a self-custody and a custodial account. Yeah, it's kind of a novel concept. I mean, when you think about, I don't know if you want to call it crypto world or blockchain, but what happens and how things work on chain, how you interact as an individual, right? In, in some ways you have... Well, certainly have a lot more control, maybe have some sovereignty as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the big difference. Um, when you have crypto with Coinbase, you have crypto with an exchange. Sure, it's there. You can trade it. It's easy to access. When you go to withdraw it into your fiat bank account, um, you're able to do that. It's very convenient. Hopefully, you're able to do that. I mean, sometimes, right, there's service outages, et cetera. But um, you're trusting that it's there but you don't actually have control over it. Not in the same way, and that's what you have to be aware of, is how much control you actually do have when you're acting as your own custodian, when you're using your own wallet, when you're the only one that has access to the keys, only you can sign transactions, transfer crypto, you store the crypto. There's risks associated with that, but that's the big difference with self-custody. You're in control. I, I think the other thing that stands out to me, and we'll move on from this slide, but the other thing that stands out is just what you can access as a result. Yeah. With a self-custody wallet, you can participate in DeFi, decentralized finance, you can access protocols, you can do really whatever you want um, within reason or within what you know the technology enables. You might not necessarily be able to do that with a centralized exchange. Again, it's not a knock on centralized exchanges. They serve a purpose. Uh, there's some very good ones out there, but you're not necessarily going to be able to use your, uh, let's say, Coinbase account or any other account to participate directly on chain, maybe over time, but you need a wallet today. You need something like the Tasty Crypto Wallet to be able to go and actually participate on chain. 
And when you do that, there's, in my opinion, so much more opportunity. I mean, certainly relative to centralized exchange. You can access thousands of tokens, different protocols, et cetera, et cetera, but you can only do that with a self-custody wallet. Yeah, um, so we talked about our first interaction with crypto, which was Coinbase. Um, so I was on Coinbase you know, a long time ago for a while until I found a, a token that I wanted to buy that they didn't offer. Um, and that's the other thing is you touched on that is the, the freedom you have with a self-custody crypto wallet. There's thousands of tokens in existence, but on most major exchanges, you can only trade a handful of them. Um, and I simply, why I opened a Web3 wallet, which is another word, another way of saying self-custody wallet or decentralized wallet, was because I wanted to have access to this coin. I, was that similar to your first experience with self-custody, why you got into it? Yeah, I think, you know, everybody's gateway drug tends to be, or for most people, it's been Bitcoin. You mm -hmm. learn about this, you'll read the white paper, whatever, then people will get into Ethereum, they start to learn that there's other things out there. Uh, maybe some of these other blockchains have different purposes or exist for different reasons compared to Bitcoin. And you learn about the ecosystem and then you naturally start to learn about what you can do, how you can participate in that space, where the opportunities are. And I think that is where you ultimately land on the self-custody side of it. You know, at some point in that journey, you're going to hear that phrase, not your keys, not your coins. Right. I think there's enough examples now of centralized crypto firms failing. Um, there's reasons, you know, real reasons why I think it's important to to be aware of self custody and and to utilize it. But yeah, I think that's that's pretty much the journey. That's kind of what happened to yeah. me. You want to participate, you want to speculate, some you want access to these things. And maybe you're only available on chain, so you need yeah. a wallet. 